Good morning, uh, good evening. Uh, this is Mona Karim. Um, I am a poet and a translator between Arabic and English. Um, I am um, speaking to you from Bard College in upstate New York. Um, for those of you who um, are listening instead of watching, um, I'm sitting um, in a private room at the library, um, Stevenson Library. Um, and um, yeah, the <laughs> the, the back, background is, is sunny and um, has some windows. Um, I'm wearing um, red frames, red glasses. Um, my hair is down, uh, medium length. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I'm not going to describe my face, but let's just say um, um, a good looking woman in her early 30s. Um, but um, yeah, um, I wanted to yeah uh, to 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 begin from really like the faculty uh, for BCLT um, this this year. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of the faculty. Um, as you may know already, um, the anthology titled "A Violent Phenomenon" uh, the, um, is is the basis for um, uh, the faculty this year. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this anthology because as um, someone who has a PhD in comparative literature and, you know, engaged heavily with translation theory, it's really good to see that um, discussions of politics of translation as well as translation theory and studies um, is now uh, expanding beyond academia, you know, and it's becoming a main concern for uh, literary translators and, and, and all kinds of translators, you know, so this is, um, this is exciting uh, to witness. Um, I was going to say also, um, you know, <laughs> um, I know that like, um, as, as, some, as a translator myself, like, we go through different phases, you know, with, with translation, with literary translation. Um, sometimes we are more concerned with questions of craft, of like the practice and you know, um, aesthetic negotiations and, you know, like things on, on the, on the level of the text, let's say. Um, and, um, um, but as you, as you may, as you can tell from this anthology and, and, and the fact that we selected there, this time we're focusing on politics, you know, uh, and I really believe that the craft and politics are simply inseparable, you know, and, um, a translator, a good translator is one that creates a balance between both and, a connection between both, a reflection um, of each, you know, like of, of uh, aesthetic and, and, and politics, a writer too, an artist too, you know, uh, so um, um, the same example, right? Uh, but before I um, discuss the, the, the um, you know, basically the topic uh, for today, which is um, titling Againist translation, againist visibility, <laughs> and I think um, you may be able to tell what I'm gonna speak about. But I wanted to, for those of you who are hungry um, to address the craft part of translation, I wanted to give just you know a few suggestions, you know, um, uh, and a few notes that may be helpful. Um, three texts that I always assign in any translation workshop or translation course. Um, to address the craft side, um, one of them is um, a canonical text, which or neo-canonical, let's say, is um, "Poetry is Not a Luxury" by Audrey Lord. Um, I really love this text because it's powerful, yet um, it's also like precise and, and brief in describing what do we do as writers. You know, I believe translators are, are writers. All kinds of artists are. Writers, at least in, when you read that text, which is really short, like two pages maybe, um, she describes over and over what do we do in, in textual expression, right? We distill the experience. We distill it into language, right? And therefore it inhabits a life, you know, it gets out, you know, it becomes um, um, something that, you know, emerges um, um, into our awareness, our consciousness, right? So I really believe this is um, a powerful and important text that any writing course, any literary course should, should, should open with. And it helps us um, connect the political and the personal um, uh, on a deeper level, right? Uh, as, a, as a commitment in, in our practice. Um, more specifically to translation, I also like to recommend um, the text titled An ABC of Translating Poetry by Willis Barnstone. 
um, who is a very experienced poetry translator, uh, as well as a poet, of course. Um, and this was published in the in 2001. Um, and although I really love this 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 text because if you read it, it feels also as like a poem on its own. It's a list of commandments. And it's a it's a list, you know, um, in, in general, um, do and don't. And like there's this section where it says like a translator is, um, I think, um, um, a thief or something like that. You know, so like there is it, it plays on the poetics of translation on on every level. Um, and I don't necessarily entirely agree with everything that um, uh, Barstone, um, uh, you know, has for us, especially, you know, around bridge translation or, you know, um, um, he uses beautiful things like uh, a poet, like um, a translation artist. You know, I like this, this kind of description, you know, um, but um, there are times where I see that there is this separation between um, a translator and uh, as an artist, right? Like, oh, uh, a bridge translator is not a poet or is not a, 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 an artist, but the poet is, you know, and therefore, you know, um, uh, this one does not have equal labor, you know? So like, I will talk more about this. Some of you might already know what I think about bridge translations. Um, so, but this, despite this fact, you know, I think this is a, a beautiful and useful um, text by Barnstone in that, a lot of the times I um, understand and figure out where I stand and, um, and uh, in regards to text, textual practices by disagreeing, right? Like sometimes in opposition and in disagreement, you, you figure out where you stand. Um, so that's okay too, right? Um, the last text I wanted to recommend, um, and, and I always assign also is titled The Eight Stages of Translation by Robert Bly. Um, an American poet and translator, well known for his translations of Lorca, of uh, Rilke, and I um, um, can't remember who else. Uh, <laughs> uh, Neruda, yes. Um, at least these are the ones that, that I've read and I really love. So in the eight stages of translation, he begins, um, like you see that Rilke poem as like um, like um, an, like a naked uh, tree trunk, you know, from the beginning in the first draft, and through the eight stages, like the tree grows before you and has leaves, and like at some point, like sunlight and sparrows, you know, um, it's it's really a gorgeous like um, uh, uh, poem uh, uh, essay um, that really captures what magical thing we do as translators, right? Draft to draft, you know, that all that you know, this cliche expression, labor of love, you know. Is, is very um, true of what we do. Um, and, you know, um, uh, Robert Bly is, is one of those translators because he's a poet, you know, and to him, like being a poet and translator is not separable. Um, he's been criticized, for example, for like sometimes editing the, 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 the origins in the sense like he would omit th uh, certain things and add, you know, uh, lines, you know, so like um, I, would like to get angry at that. <laughs> you know, I, I think that definitely there's something problematic about this. Um, however, I really appreciate these texts because they are beautiful, you know, like as poems, they are just beautiful, you know? And this makes me wonder, like, um, I, I'm someone who believes like that translation is a genre of literature. It's not like beside literature. It's not a bridge. It's not like, you know, uh, um, uh, yeah, like a uh, communication, connection, whatever. It's a genre of literature. That's what I think of it. Um, and I'm saying this because I wonder when are we going to begin to think about creating subgenres of this genre, right? So um, uh, this, like Robert Bly could be um, doing the subgenre of adaptation, the subgenre of collaboration, right? Um, other translators um, who give themselves much more liberty can be doing can be doing um, an anti-translation. A bridge translation can be called, I proposed calling it a rendition, you know, it can be called an anti-translation, you know. So um, this is just something I'm leaving here um, for you to think about, um, um, like how, how can we reimagine um, translation and expand it really, like the, its borders and, and, and its its, um, uh, its grounds, its, uh, its um, 
levels or not levels, but let's say layers in, in that sense. Okay. Um, now that I addressed the craft side, I hope these were helpful suggestions and notes. Um, to get to the point, you know, um, what I meant by a games translation. Um, uh, so I recently wrote an essay titled Western Poets Kidnap Your Poems and Call Them Translations. And the, uh, the subtitle was um, on, the, on the Colonial Phenomenon of Rendition as Translation. Um, and as I mentioned, like, I propose that we stop using the word, uh, the title, the, sorry, the term bridge translation and instead use um, rendition because really that's what I think of it. <laughs> you know, you're getting someone to do a rough draft um, of, of uh, uh, you know, a, a, a rough translation of a text and then you're taking it and workshopping it um, to hell um, and you're calling this a translation. Um, and I'm not really interested in guarding what is a translation or not. But I think um, it's important, um, like naming is very important in this case um, because it helps us understand, you know, literary interactions, right? And like, how do we go about um, this literature, that literature? There are literary hi hierarchies, there are literary economies. We don't exist in some abstract like utopia or something, you know, as much as we want to imagine literature to be so, it's not, you know, it's, we are very much, you know, the world and the text, you know, essay teaches us, you know, are, are not separable. Um, so um, there is this paragraph that I would like um, to read from the, from the essay, in which I say, I had thought that the phenomenon of Western poets adapting someone's translation had vanished. I would argue that it did disappear for a few years from English only to return at the hands of poets, not translators. Translation has become cool. In some way, its popularity speaks of the failure of a liberal intellectual class wrestling with the rise of Western fascism. It, re it rejuvenates their monolingual addiction and imagery. It fits in the 10-year dossier. It rescues the third world poet who is always imagined as a singular voice against the savage masses, as if the Cold War has never ended, or God forbid, hasn't been won by the United States. Translation today, as Carla Dima Ayub argues, is seen not only as a necessity, but also necessarily good. What makes translations a must? Where does this blind faith in translation come from? Doesn't translation act also as unconditional access, as surveillance, as an expanding force of the global capitalist market of literature. So um, I chose to read this specific um, paragraph, which is, as you can see, it's it's loaded, you know, and um, I don't know really where to begin here. Um, but as you know, like in the past, let's say, decade, um, there has been um, uh, so much interest in literary translation and talking about translation, not only just doing it, you know, also talking about it. Um, um, and this is, of course, parallel to, you know, uh, um, how much translation theory, you know, since they were there and, 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 um, and also someone like Abdel Fattah Kleto as well, you know, that, that school and up until now, you know, you've, you've been seeing translation theory um, expand more and more and get more uh, attention, become central for um, the several disciplines. Um, but uh, to go back to my point is... Um, um, I'm saying against translation because I am suspicious of um, all this celebration. You know, I don't, I always think that um, celebrating this, celebrating that is um, patronizing or um, uh, shallow or, you know, limited, you know, it, even with that, the best intentions. Um, and I would like to, to focus as an example on Arabic literature, for example, like when you go and read the catalog of, the three translations from the Arabic published in the United States. This is something available online. You can go um, to Rochester University. Um, the that they have a whole translation database uh, according to languages, um, and you will see that um, most of the translations are done by academics. They are published by university presses, uh, and often they're directed to um, benefit literary uh, 
um, studies, which is, you know, okay. What is not okay is the fact that this is the dominant space only, meaning there is a ghettoization of this given literature, say Arabic literature, to become only material for the classroom, right? So I feel like you cannot be a translator between Arabic and English and not and, and not address this fact. Of course, I'm not placing this on you as an individual. We cannot change things as individuals, but these are the kind of conversations that we need to translate into practices, right? Um, um, as as uh, translators, this is one thing. Um, the other thing I want to say, you know, as translators, like we need to ask ourselves the question, when I translate this poem, this novel, this whatever, um, what is this going to do in the target language, right? Like, um, this is not only about serving the original text. This is not only about, like, of course, I'm not saying, like, you can't translate a poem because you don't, because you like it. That's, you know, sometimes it's as simple as this. I like this. I'm going to translate it. You know, that's absolutely legitimate and, and in fact, beautiful. Um, but to, to, to get, you know, into the more complex areas of, of, of our practice is, um, um, I like to, to think about, like, how does this interfere in the target language? You know, if you think about someone like Akhmatova or someone like Darwish or uh, Lorca, uh, these are poets that, in translation, influenced others as well, right? Um, maybe a more precise example would be how um, a, a South Asian um, um, and um, American poet like Ava Shahid Ali um, he introduced Ghazal, which is like an ancient, you know, um, uh, poetry form in, in, in the uh, Indian subcontinent and um, in, in, in Persian, um, Persian art um, uh, cultures as well, and originates from a, an Arabic poetry form, right? Like, he introduced this poetry form um, to Americans through translation. He did, like, I mean, he wrote Ghazal poems himself, but he made a whole anthology um, tr um, translating Ghazal poems into English. Now, Ghazal or Ghazal has become a, an American poetic form. And I think this is the most like beautiful example I can give you about like, you know, literary interactions and, 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 and some of the magic that like translation um, um, achieves, right? Um, so, um, um, against translation, this proposal or this call that I'm saying, it's about being suspicious of where, or being skeptical, being, um, um, you know, interrogating where we, where do we stand? Why do we translate? Uh, am I being invasive? Am I, you know, who is this for, right? Like, um, um, all these are legitimate questions, you know? Um, sometimes, you know, people say the urgency of the text. Sometimes I say, like, what if it's not urgent, right? Like, what if it's for a future moment? What if it's like, you know, what if the past continues and the, <laughs> into the present, which is, it always does, right? Like, so, um, um, I, it's not like there's a set of questions that are definite that we need to apply. Um, it's always up to you, you know, to read your context and, you know, um, to try and, and um, can, yeah, like read both contexts really and, and make the best out of it in, in that sense. Um, the last point I, I want to make is um, about visibility, right? Um, or really what I say against visibility. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with like the, the call to um, name the translator on the cover, um, which I think is, you know, um, um, fair enough, right? Like, why, why not? Um, I want to say in, in Arabic literature, um, um, there is no way a translation is published without... Um, the translator's name on the cover. So I, when I saw it, like the call in English, I was like, wow, I never noticed that they don't have their names on the cover. You know, like that was never something that caught my, my, my eye. Um, and in Arabic, when you see an, an, an Arabic translation of a book that doesn't have the translator's name, um, pe people wonder like, is this a bootleg, you know, copy? Like, um, um, like it's part of like the, um, the value of the book to have the translator on the cover, you know, so like, that's not something we had to fight for, that was a given. Um, and um, uh, in, in Arabic as well, like people trust translators, you know, you, you read a couple translations of 
this given translator and you make your mind like is this someone you're gonna stick with or they're not you know they're not for you they're not good you don't like their choices you don't like their language you don't you don't think they they do a good job right so um we have translators who are you know um how like like big names like someone like Saleh and Mani you know who's very much celebrated he thanks to him we know like we were introduced to a lot of Latin American um um, fiction um, and um, also Portuguese uh, 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 language um, um, fiction. You know, so, so whenever I see and like this is this is even growing up like and, and um, going to book fairs or bookstores. You know, I see Salah and money. I don't need to read what is this book. I just grab it. You know, so there is that like um, so translators have that like you know um, um, and, like place in, in Arabic literature. And I, I can get <laughs> carried away in, in, in this direction and refer you back to Abdel Fattah Kleto and how authorship is, is a Western, you know, conception and, you know, um, in Arabic, it's it's form that, you know, form and genre that are more important than authorship. Authorship is always contested in Arabic literature, right? Even though, of course, in, this is not necessarily the case in modern Arabic literature anymore. Um, but to go back to my po point, uh, and I mentioned this like authorship um, and, and you know that that illusion, I am really concerned that now translators would buy into this visibility you know trap because that was always our magical power that we are invisible, right? Um, we are like the ghost or we are the specter that there that thinks about or we are you know um, um, the spirit, you know so like, the, these kind of figures are supernatural. Um, they are invincible, right? Like they, they, they leave their mark. There's no way you can avoid their mark. Um, however, they are not visible, you know? So like I am suspicious or skeptical of visibility. And I think so there's something that can be compromised when translators become um, um, too, too visible. I think visibility is a capitalist logic as well. Um, I think you know, and, and has like this individualistic, you know, lo logic to it. Um, and I just, I would like to, I would like us to consider this idea of like diversity versus democratization of literature, you know? So of course we need diversity and in, in, in translation and literature and so on, but this diversity has to also be ambitious, you know? It has to um, think about like transgressing and about like um, uh, having radical potentials, you know? Like um, if you are someone familiar with Ishmael Reed, you know, please go read more about this guy because he he really is one of those people and the people around him, of course, his generation, um, um, had a, a unique and effective way of democratizing American literature without co-opting it, without, you know, making it uh, institutional, you know, making it, you know, uh, reinforcing the same status quo, you know, so that's something for us as translators to consider. What do we do, you know, like with this diversity other than, you know, saying, oh, like, it's from this community or it's from this language, you know, what more can we do with that, right? I also think of, like, you know, translators being the perfect coalition of uh, of labor and arts, right? And and um, you, you will always see in text, you know, that are pro-translation or anti-translation that we are always getting pushed toward labor or toward art, right? Oh, no, you're not artists, you're laborers. Or, oh, no, you're not laborers, you're artists, right? Like, so I, I think we are like that perfect balance between both, you know, and that perfect meet, you know, meet, meet up, you know, um, uh, or meeting of, of both. Um, so um, um, I, I think as artists, you know, that side of us, you know, as artists, yeah, what we can call for is we need more say in the bookmaking. We need... Um, we we want to have um, um, more say against the market, right? Like we, we want to expand. Like what what can Americans or British or whatever? I'm saying this just because I work between Arabic and English, you know. Um, so like, how can I push against the market? And again, it's not all individual work. This has to be collective, you know. Um, so that is one one side. And as laborers, we need better conditions, unions, payments, you know, all of these things, right? So the last of my concerns would be visibility, would be, you know, getting more credit, you know, um, saying that, oh, I have equal share in the text as if 
the thing because that's a real state logic, you know. Um, so I will, I don't want to compromise my invisibility um, to partake in a capitalist, you know, reimagining of translation. That would be horrific, right? So um, um, last thing I want to say is embrace <laughs> your invisibility as a superpower. Always be skeptical. Um, I think, yeah, more skepticism and, and less faith. Uh, maybe more faith in in, um, in other areas, like again, you know, uh, um, working collectively to change the status quo of uh, literary translation and expanding our practices, expanding um, um, like yeah, the labels as well, right? Translation, so genres of translation, translation as a literary genre. Um, so these these are my two cents, as we say. Um, I hope you have a beautiful experience at the BCLT Summer School, and um, I will see you on the other side.